Hello everyone, my name is Paola. Welcome to Mindalia TV live stream where thousands of people around the world gather daily to watch the interviews and talks organized by MindaliaTV.com. In this occasion, we have Dr. Nikisha Hammond with a talk titled How to Properly Diagnose HDHD. Dr. Hammond is the TV show host of Parenting Explained with Dr. Hammond. She's a speaker, an author, and owner of the Hammond Psychology and Associates. The, she also consults with media to increase public education about mental health issues. Before we welcome our guest today, I would like to remind you all that if you would like to help the world through Mindalia, there's a few things you can do just uh, by subscribing to Mindalia TV live stream. Um, sorry, Mindalia TV on YouTube channel. Uh, also give us a like or leave a positive comment down below the screen. Uh, please know that with these actions, you're helping us reach even more people who can benefit from the content that we share in our channel. Also, to allow your interaction, please remember there's a chat on the side of your screen. You can ask the questions that you would like to today to our very special guest, Dr. Nikisha Hammond, uh, who will uh, kindly answer them by the end of her lecture. Without further delay, please welcome Dr. Nikisha Hammond. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Great. We're ready to listen to your talk. Thank you so much. Great. So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in, for those of you tuning in live, and for some of you watching the replay of this. So I'm going to talk to you about a really important topic, and that is how to properly diagnose ADHD, because what's happening right now is, as of 2016 estimates, there are about 6 million children that have been diagnosed at some point with ADHD. So we want to know how to appropriately diagnose ADHD because as you know, it's very, very overdiagnosed. So I'm gonna go through five steps with you today. So step one, consultation. In this step, the first thing that you need to do, if you suspect or your child's teacher suspects or a family member or whomever suspects your child has ADHD, you need to consult with your family physician whether it's your pediatrician or your family doctor or whomever you go to for medical advice, you need to consult with them because what I've seen a lot of times is there are children that have physical health issues that look like attention problems. So let's not be so quick to diagnose ADHD if really your child could have low blood sugar, they could have anemia, they could have all sorts of things going on with them, right? So step one is to consult with your pediatrician or your family physician. Now, I would highly recommend, I've recommended this to everyone that we've seen in our office to get blood work done. So I know already what you're thinking. Let's say you have a six-year-old. I have a five-year-old son at home. Um, let's say you have a six-year-old who's terrified of going to the doctor to get shots because I don't know about your children, but uh, most children are very afraid of getting shots. So what I would recommend when my child was, when my son was about three or four, um, he had to get blood work done because uh, we thought he had allergies, right? And what they did was really cool actually, is they took uh, the pediatrician prescribed a numbing cream and they just put it on their arm and then you cover it in like saran wrap. Um, and what it does is basically, it doesn't take away necessarily the fear, of getting the blood work, but it does take away that little sting a bit um, that kids are so afraid of. So I would recommend you talking to your pediatrician of that. I mean, I went through that as a mom myself and saw that it helped somewhat, again, not completely taking away the fear, but most times uh, family physicians are not doing blood work, especially for a six-year-old, let's say, or seven or eight-year-old. Um, but if you suspect that your child has ADHD, you want to make sure the blood work is done because you do not want to diagnose ADHD if there's something else and you're taking medication for the wrong thing. Another thing is sometimes children have ADHD and another physical health condition, which again, like I mentioned earlier, could be low blood sugar, it could be a thyroid issue, it could be low iron, all sorts of things. So you wanna make sure again that that piece is addressed. Very, very, very important to do an in-depth analysis and do a consultation with your pediatrician to rule out any medical causes of their attention issues. So we're gonna move on to step two. I may be a little bit biased as a psychologist, but I'm really excited about this step. 
um, because I've done psychological evaluations, which is the next step in evaluation um, for many years now. And really and truly, it's, it's so different from taking five minutes to look at a child, which is done very often throughout the world. We tend to look at children, we say, okay, they have an issue with attention and we automatically diagnose ADHD. But the beauty of getting an evaluation or a psychological evaluation is that you really get to see different parts of a child. So I'm gonna explain this because I know for most parents, they've never even heard of what a psychological evaluation entails. So I'm gonna get into this in more depth. So first thing is that's important is what in the world is a psychological evaluation? I know to some people it sounds very scary. Uh, so basically what it is, it takes, it takes a couple of hours and depending on the psychologist, it could be a, a clinical psychologist or a psychologist specializing in clinical psychology. It could be a psychologist that specializes in neuropsychology. There's all sorts of different specialties. Make sure step one, that you go to someone that is familiar with ADHD. So if there is a psychologist and they're specializing in adult issues and have never seen anyone with ADHD, I would not be the person to go to, <laughs> okay? So find a specialist that is familiar with ADHD. Now, what is psychological tests? Number one, my, one of my favorite tests um, is an IQ test. And I know what you're probably thinking. You're thinking, well, with an IQ test, what in the world does that have to do with ADHD? So an IQ test is not designed to prove whether or not a child has ADHD but what it does is it starts to look at the intellectual ability of that child. So that means, let's say, let me give you an example. I've seen a lot of elementary school children that people say, I think they have ADHD. But when I give them an IQ test, you know what I discover? One of two things. Either one, they are so smart, right? Their IQs are, they're brilliant, really brilliant kids. And they're actually gifted, but they have been labeled as having attention problems, behavior problems, because frankly, they're bored in their classroom. Okay, so IQ test is only one part, but it's very important to see where a child is. The other thing I see is either a child that's really, really bright, or sometimes I see a child that um, learns in a slower manner, right? So you're, the IQ may be a little bit lower, and there's this expectation you know, why isn't my child doing well in school? Well, it's because they just learn at a slower pace and, and it doesn't have anything to do with ADHD. So that's one step is the IQ test. The other test that's often done is called an achievement test. And that basically looks at where is a child performing at um, in reading, writing, and math at a grade appropriate level. So let's say you have, let's say you have a fourth grader at home and your child is struggling at, in school. Well, if they're performing on a nationally normed test, if they're performing at a second grade level or first grade level, let's say, it's going to be really difficult for them to do fourth grade level work. Uh, so some of the things to look at in a psychological evaluation is whether or not a child has a learning disability. This is very often, I've seen it many times, misdiagnosed as ADHD. There are many, many children... I mean, countless children that I have met that either have a learning disability and ADHD, or they really have a learning issue that is thought to be ADHD. So that is a, a huge question that you need to understand when getting a psychological evaluation. The other piece of a psychological evaluation is looking at social factors. It's looking at emotional factors of your child, their personality, how do they function, how do they cope? what's going on at home. It's a very, very thorough process. As I mentioned earlier, it can take hours to go through testing with a child or a teen. Um, in fact, to really see, do they have ADHD? Do they have depression? Do they have anxiety? Is it a learning issue? The list goes on and on. And the reason why this is a critical step, so we're on step two now, the evaluation, the psychological evaluation. The reason why this is a critical step is because even the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has said that two thirds, almost two thirds of kids with ADHD have another condition too. <laughs> so this is the problem when, if you go to whatever type of evaluation you go to 
And if someone takes five minutes, five or 10 minutes to look at your child and say, you know what, it's ADHD and go about your merry way. Well, guess what? There's a high chance there's something else. That's why the psychological evaluation is so important to really see what else could be going on or what really is causing the attention issues, which is not always ADHD. So this is, again, as I mentioned, a very critical step. If you're wondering where to find a psychologist, you can look if you, I know this, uh, people watching this are watching all over the world. So if you are in the United States, you can go to uh, the American Psychological Association, which is APA.org. Uh, you can try um, your state psychological association. So for example, I live in Florida. So you can Google like Florida Psychological Association and look for psychologists. If you live in a different country or I mean, wherever you live, you can just basically Google psychologist ADHD testing, something like that. But it's so critical to make sure that your child has an evaluation, a proper, a proper evaluation. Some of the things to prepare your child, I often get the question, um, how do I prepare my child for this testing? So think of it as just academic testing that they normally have. Having a good breakfast, getting enough sleep the night before, you can't really prepare and study uh, for psychological testing, um, but it's just more about getting them prepared to do you know, the best job that they can do during the testing. Another piece of the psychological evaluation is what we call the clinical interview, which means that a parent or caregiver will have, usually takes about an hour, maybe an hour and a half, of a variety of questions about your life because it's so important to know, again, what is going on with this, ch with this child, really. Um, what is going on in your family? What is going on in your child's life? Who they are? I mean, it's, it's looking at the whole child to see if ADHD is an issue or if it's something else. So before we move to the next step, I wanna remind you something to, to really think about with a psychological evaluation is think of it like blood work, right? So when you, if you're, let's say you suspected your child of having blood sugar issues, let's say, you wouldn't go into the doctor and say, please test my child for only blood sugar issues and don't tell me if anything else is going on with my child, right? I mean, that's silly, right? So what you, and as an adult, when you get your blood work, you have a list of things they're looking for. Is there an iron issue? Is there diabetes? Is there, um, you know, iron issue? Whatever it is, there's a slew of things that they, uh, there's usually like, I don't know, 20 things or whatever, right? In the lab work. It's the same thing with psychological testing. Um, so don't be afraid of that for your child. It really looks at all the possibilities for mental health conditions. ADHD or not, usually that occurs in what's something called a feedback session. And in that feedback session, you will get a report really that shows your child's strengths, things to work on, how are they doing intellectually, socially, emotionally, um, you know, all these different uh, parts of, of them, which is really important. And I have had children that um, I've tested and I've told parents, you know what, it's actually it has nothing to do with ADHD. But the reason why they're having problems with attention is because they're really, really anxious and really they just had some anxiety to deal with. I've had some families that I've said, you know what, it's, it is ADHD, but really it's, they're also struggling with school. And as I mentioned earlier, learning disability, there's some children that don't even have a mental health condition, um, but really they're struggling with adjusting to something that has happened in their family, which could mean a divorce, it could mean um, a loss of a parent. It could mean a parent that's having financial difficulties, um, a loss of a best friend or bullying. A lot of times they hear bullying or something else, right? This is why it's so important to, to really look at the whole child when we're making these decisions. So confirmation is a really, really important step. Another great thing in the confirmation stage is to understand that while you, while it's so critical, as I mentioned, to do the psychological evaluation, also realize that during that feedback session, you might have more homework to do as a parent, and you might need to go into other realms, uh, meaning you might have to, let's say this, your child has some sensory issues, 
you may need to go to a specialist to see if there's a sensory problem. Uh, you may need to go, I've often referred families to a um, speech language pathologist, let's say if there's speech issues, or an occupational therapist or physical therapist or neurologist. And I know I'm throwing out a lot of information. Um, this may or may not apply to your child, but be prepared in the confirmation stage to know, yes, it's ADHD, no, it's not, it's a combination of things, or here's your next steps. That's going to be very critical. And please follow up on the recommendations uh, that, your psycho that your psychologist and your physician recommend to you. Now, one thing I do want to say uh, before going to the next step is a lot of times a very common question that I have received is what about the label of ADHD? Okay. So you may be watching this and you have already heard uh, or been told that your child has ADHD or you may be wondering. Here's my strong professional opinion about the label of ADHD. There are many, many labels and the reason why there's so much heartache, I feel like around this label is because it has to do with mental health. Because the reality is if your child had a uh, uh, blood sugar issue, high blood pressure, uh, if they had anemia, if they had cancer, if they had any sort of other physical condition, we're not uh, necessarily trained to think of that as a bad thing. We think of it as, okay, my child has the flu or the cold or whatever else that they have, and that's okay. But once it gets to the point of a mental health condition like ADHD, then we are so concerned about the label. So I am, I am for having a diagnosis because you need to know what is going on with your child. Many, many parents have come to me to say, I don't know what is going on with my child. You need to know the what. Once you know the what, then you know how to help your child best. And that's what we're going to get into in, in the next part. But keep that in mind when you think about the label. And again, I'm not here to say that there's only positive things because honestly, for what it's worth, there are stereotypes that people still have and things that are really not true um, when they hear ADHD. But I'm hoping that we're working as a society to really, really change that. Um, but, but please keep that in mind uh, when you think about getting help because it's, it's really, it's so critical. Um, for kids to get the help that they need once you know what is going on with your child. So on to the next step. Um, the next step is intervention. So again, we just went through confirmation, which is knowing, yes, my child has ADHD, my child has ADHD and something else, or my child doesn't have ADHD, has something else. Either way, the next step after that is intervention. And there's a couple ways to look at this. Let's say your child was diagnosed with ADHD. There are really... Uh, Three ways to look at intervention when it comes to children. One is you need to understand how your child themselves needs to be helped, uh, which means many children, there's different types of ADHD, but if you have a child that's very hyperactive, has a difficult time with impulsivity in controlling themselves, they can learn skills to manage their physical or their hyperactivity and manage the impulsivity and the attention issues, they can learn those skills to try to control that. So one of the things that can be helpful, especially with younger children, is play therapy. Um, at, well, at this point in my career, I do primarily evaluations, but at the beginning of my career, I did uh, more therapy and it was so beneficial for the little, when I say the little ones, I mean like preschool age, early elementary school age, maybe later elementary school, depending on um, their maturity level. Um, but play therapy really is something that it feels like they're playing, um, but obviously there's therapeutic techniques in there. I would never put a six-year-old, let's say, on a couch to talk through ADHD. That would be highly not recommended. Um, so definitely make sure they get a good play therapist if they're, again, of the younger crowd. For the older teens, it's, it's a bit different and they can handle, you know, sort of talking through how they're doing in high school and, and things like that. But therapy is going to be a, a, a really good start as far as, again, your child learning the skills. So it's threefold. Your child needs to learn the skills. Oftentimes, parents, there are parent sessions uh, that you can do as well. So thinking of the family unit and how you can best cope with this diagnosis of ADHD. And 
I know oftentimes with parents, there's a concern, like, do I need to do parent skills therapy? And uh, what does that say about me as a parent? I'm going to tell you, I'm just going to be very real with you. Um, please, please, I know it's hard, but do not blame yourself for this. Um, there are a gazillion research studies and poor parenting does not cause ADHD, uh, first of all. So don't feel guilty about this diagnosis because you could be the best parent in the world and your ch child can still have ADHD. So instead of, of taking it to heart and, and thinking that there's something wrong with your parenting, think of it more as, let's say you have two kids, maybe two or three kids. Maybe your other children uh, don't have ADHD, but one of your children does. Well, you have to parent them differently. And it's just a skill to understand this condition is all it really is. Um, so I, I really want you to, to really keep that in mind um, as a parent, um, because I have a lot of parents that are concerned. What did I do wrong? Is it something I said? It was, was it the way my child? Um, is it because of my parenting? You know, all these things that come to mind. And it's really, really not. But there are things that you can put in place at home that can help your child. So keep that in mind. So parent uh, sessions are, can be really helpful. Depending on the needs of your child, there's also social skills therapy. There's uh, groups for kids that maybe struggle a little bit socially. So some kids, particularly with the younger crowd, are hyperactive or more impulsive. That can be really difficult um, to enter, for them to interact with other kids or for them to respond to other kids. Um, unfortunately, kids are really mean these days. Um, they're, I, I don't know, they're, they're, it's, it's horrible. <laughs> um, I could go on and on uh, about kids and bullying, but kids really, they notice that there's differences with other children. And especially with ADHD, there's a lot of comments that kids make. So really taking the time to teach your child social skills and if they need to be in a group um, to sort of process bullying and things like that would be really, really beneficial for them. And the, the, the third piece of it, so again, helping your child, right? Helping yourself as a parent and self-care is critical. Um, so helping yourself as a parent. And then the third piece of the intervention is, is the school. So a lot of times there's, depending on the school, there's a lot of different things that a school can do. And it's critical that you get the school involved with making changes, right? So if, let's say your child has a learning issue and ADHD. They can change the curriculum. They can put more things in place. If they're struggling with attention so they're not finishing things in time, they can have extra time. There's many, many things to do um, in the school setting. So, so the, those are the three main areas that we think of with intervention. Um, and another piece of this is, I wanna take a quick second to talk about the medication issue. Uh, this is a common question that I received with medication and ADHD. First, I want to say I am not a medical doctor. I'm a psychologist. So in my state, and I live in Florida, we, as of now, psychologists do not have prescription privileges. They do in other states and the US um, and some other states, but not Florida as yet. Uh, but I, my opinion on this is that I'm not anti-medication, but there's many, many children that I've met, many, that do not necessarily need medication to cope with ADHD. That being said, there are obviously many children that do need medication. So it's definitely a family decision. Decision, I would say to talk to your team, talk to your psychologist, talk to your medical doctor. You know, there's a team of people that you should be working with and really to talk with them, but to make a thorough decision. That is my wish for you, if anything, uh, out of this lecture tonight, to really make a thorough decision about it though, because as I mentioned, I've met many children with mild ADHD symptoms that did amazing in therapy, were able to learn how to control the symptoms and did not need medication. That is not to say that no child you know, doesn't need medication. So just keeping that in mind. Uh, the other thing is, as far as interventions, is uh, some parents have asked me about like a change in diet or getting more exercise and those sorts of things. So right now the data is the data is more or less mixed. There are some studies that say, great, you know, you change certain things in your diet or take out red dye, do gluten-free and all these, you know, sorts of diets to help with attention. There's 
natural that's on the market to help with it. Less though, overall, the research does say that it's not a cure for ADHD. But here's my thought. Here's my real thought on this. Let's say there was a research study, right, that they had 100 kids. And I'm just throwing out a number here. Let's say 90 of them, um, they found that these change in diets or going into nature and getting more exercise didn't really do anything. But like 10 of them, it did let's say like only 10%. And again, I'm just making up some numbers here. That study might be published and they say, nope, it doesn't work, but it worked for a really small percentage, probably actually more like three kids, but it worked for a really small percentage. So here's my thoughts on this. Try, you know, try these things that if you feel that it may work, try these things, but as an expectation, look for control and not cure. So if you're expecting this cure, it'll never, you know, it'll magically go away the attention symptoms very unlikely. Could it possibly control your child's symptoms to help them? Sure. Right? Sure. It, because if it doesn't work for 97% of people or 99% of people, it doesn't, you don't know if your child is in that one to 3%, right? So that's my thought on it. Um, again, not a cure, but it's something that some parents I have spoken with have found successful to change certain things naturally uh, for their child. Uh, the last phase um, out of the five phases. So, so far we've talked about consultation. We've talked about evaluation, confirmation, intervention. And um, this last piece is a very important piece is collaboration. So what does that mean? Collaboration is really, really, really important. <laughs> so when you are dealing with ADHD or Again, ADHD and a combination of something else it could be a behavior issue. It could be depression. It could be anxiety. It could be autism. It could be many, many other things, right? You have to have a team of people, a team of specialists to have the best care for your child. So of uh, over for over a decade, I've been meeting with so many parents, especially with kids with ADHD. And the number one thing that I think is a theme for all of the parents that I've met with is they just want the best for their child. <laughs> okay. So, which is amazing and wonderful. So in order to make that happen, you have to think of it again, as a team effort to collaborate, whether let's say your team is the pediatrician, your psychologist, you may have an occupational therapist, You'll have the school academic team that's helping you, and you may have someone else on board, some other specialist, right? Make sure that all of these people are communicating. Now, if you have a psychologist, let's say your child is in therapy for ADHD, you will need to sign, if you feel comfortable, you will, will need to sign a release of information. Um, the same thing with uh, the doctor's office, obviously, it's like the HIPAA because there's HIPAA. Um, so you do, do need to sign a release of information, but when you sign that, then you give that team the ability to communicate with each other, which is very, very important because everyone plays a role. And you, as a parent, you know your child better than anyone. So you have to communicate with those team members and the team members need to communicate with each other. So it is imperative to collaborate as a team. Uh, the other thing is sometimes if your child is involved in some type of extracurricular activity, this may be, I mean, it could be sports, it could be the art, it could be music or something else, you know, outside of school. It's really, really important also that they are a part of this team. Because there are things I mentioned earlier, the school interventions, there are also interventions that can happen at that level. Um, speak, I mean, it's, it's really important to speak with the coach or speak with the music teacher or, you know, whomever it is. And it really explain to them, yes, your child has ADHD, but here specifically for your child is how they learn best or how they operate best or just basically giving them tips um, of how they can best help your child. So that's going to be uh, really, really important. So <laughs> that was a lot, I know. Um, but really, uh, so again, I'm going to read a one last time, just these five steps. But really, the, the biggest thing that I want you to remember is to really have hope in this process. 
there are so many negative things that you hear in the media and that you see online and things like that with ADHD. But I have met some of the most amazing parents and families uh, with kids with ADHD. And again, you have to put these things in place <laughs> that I'm telling you, but it, re it really can be helpful. I, I, I promise you that uh, especially the school interventions, putting things in place can really help your child. Getting the therapy that your child needs. I know it's difficult. I know there's a stigma. Getting family therapy if you need to, very, very important. Uh, there's different things that you can do again as a family and also to help your child. So the five things, one, consultation. Uh, the second thing is the evaluation. The third thing is confirmation. The fourth thing is intervention. And the fifth thing and the last thing, very, very, very important, is collaboration. So those are the five key things of how to properly understand ADHD to get it diagnosed and the next steps after that to help your child be really, really successful. So thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you, Mr. Ms. Uh, hello. There we go. Thank you, Dr. Hammond, for this valuable information. Um, before we continue to the questions from the audience, I would like to remind everyone that Mindali is a nonprofit organization and our main goals are to help spread human knowledge and to promote planetary solidarity by all means. An important way to collaborate with Mindalia is to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Mindalia TV. Uh, give us a like on this video or leave a positive comment down below. That way we uh, share this information with more people around the world who can benefit from the content of our channel. Now it is time to pass on to the audience questions to our guest, um, Dr. Hammond. I'm gonna read out loud the questions to you. Perfect. Let's see. We have our first question here. It says, do you know how, do you know of any holistic or alternative choice of coping with HDHD? Yes. Um, so actually it's interesting. Um, I believe in Europe, actually, they're working on uh, uh, having children spend more time in nature, which they have found some benefit. I mean, some true benefits of that, particularly with children with ADHD. Um, but it was very specific. So it has to be, I mean, cause when you think of nature, it could be anywhere, but it has to be like really calming places, a lot of greenery. So a lot of trees or, um, like the water and those sorts of things they have found really calming benefits of that for children. Um, the other thing is, and again, I want to say this very loosely for some families, they have found uh, some families that I, that I have spoken with. So this is not on a, you know, big, huge global scale here with research, but they have found some benefits with, um, omega-3 fatty acids and, um, also taking away red dyes, gluten-free diets. So again, there's no promises for those, uh, not a bunch of huge, uh, support for it research wise, but as I mentioned earlier, let's say the research study found that 98% of the children in that study didn't benefit, but two did, then we I mean, there's no way to know if your child would technically be in that 2%. Um, so I, I'm, you know, definitely a fan of, you know, changing diets, if that would be helpful for your child, um, and definitely increasing the exercise and definitely spending more time in nature, because they're really starting to find some benefits with that. Thank you, Dr. Hammond. Next question. What can you recommend to someone diagnosed with ADHD and anxiety disorders? Good question. So that is actually really uh, one of the most commonly um, diagnosed conditions, anxiety with ADHD. Um, so depending on, so anxieties, there's actually, gosh, there's like eight anxiety disorders. So depending on what type of anxiety would first be really important to look at. So for example, is a child having social anxiety uh, where maybe like a social skills group would be really helpful. And actually you can deal with both ADHD and anxiety with a social skills group. Um, is it more what we call generalized anxiety, which means your child is worrying about everything <laughs> that you can think of, but more worry than the typical uh, child. Um, that would be a process to really look at, let's say they're a younger child, play therapy, or individual therapy, or just helping them to manage their anxiety symptoms. Uh, because sometimes what happens with anxiety and ADHD is they actually trigger one another. So you get so anxious that you can't concentrate. 
you can't concentrate for too long, then you get more anxious, right? So we have to work on stopping the cycle. Um, another thing to think about is if, if, again, depending on the severity of it, if you decide to take the medication route, you really need to make sure that whomever is prescribing understands that there's two different conditions. Because if you start to treat only one, let's say you only treat the ADHD, but your child really has anxiety, then you're really half treating the problem and you're still going to see the problem show up in school. Um, so medically making sure that, um, you know, is, is being treated is, is really, really um, would be really helpful. And as far as what type of therapy, if you choose a therapy route, there's something called cognitive behavioral therapy, which really helps a child, especially with anxiety, helps a child deal with what we call cognitions or your thoughts, negative thoughts, usually, um, and also your behaviors. So a lot of time, a lot of kids I've seen, it's so sad. Um, a lot of kids I've seen with anxiety, they will tell themselves all sorts of negative things that are not true. Like I'm stupid. And I'm like, no, I just tested you. You are gifted. Like you're brilliant or I'm ugly or I am not good enough or, you know, those kinds of negative things, which cause anxiety. So having a type of therapy, like cognitive behavioral therapy to work on those thoughts, work on the behavior, deep breathing exercises, things like that is, is huge. And I highly would recommend you do that as a child or help your child learn those skills early so that as they grow into teenagers and adults, that they have the skills to be able to regulate the anxiety and the ADHD. Great. Thank you, Dr. Hammond. The next question says, what do you recommend as a treatment for ADHD teens who also have depression? Mm, that's a good one. There's a lot of teens right now, unfortunately, with depression. Um, so also depression comes in different forms. It's hard because I know when we hear depression and anxiety, we think of one thing, but it looks really different uh, depending on the teen. So if your teen, a lot of teens that I'm meeting are really struggling with cyberbullying. Uh, they're struggling with self-esteem issues in particular. If that is the case for your child, um, I mean, therapy is definitely a good option. Making sure at home, you have to evaluate what's going on at home. Um, a lot of times, especially with teens, I'm starting to see, besides norm, the normal, I don't feel understood, um, they're really struggling with things that you may not think they're struggling with. If there's conflict in the home, let's say, if there's a major change, like a move, a loss in the family, um, or major financial issues and those sorts of things. A lot of teens lately are like really taking that on, um, which is causing a lot of depression. You also need to monitor as much as possible. I know they're teenagers, but monitor as much as possible the social media aspect. A lot of teens right now, especially with everything going on in the world, they're very, very exposed to the news. They're constantly viewing images, violent images. I mean, constantly. Um, as we've seen, some teens are even getting to the point where they're videotaping other people. I mean, people are dying. People are getting severely injured and they're videotaping that. But they're also watching. They're consuming so much of that. Um, so really looking to see um, where this depression is sort of stemming from. If you're not sure, you know, then a psychologist. And also, especially with depression, uh, you, we, you need to make sure that there's no physical issues going on. Um, because depression, a lot of times can be due to thyroid issues. It could be due to blood sugar. It can be due to something else. You want to make sure that there's nothing or low iron or, you know, something else that's causing them to be um, fatigued. And, and as a parent, uh, what you can do is just really reach out to them and check in often. And I know it's hard a lot with the teens because, well, they're teenagers, so they may roll their eyes or be like, oh, my parents don't really care about me or whatever it is that they say. But I will tell you, honestly, again, back when I did therapy, it's so amazing. Even with teens, they really do take to heart what you tell them. Your heart to heart talks mean a lot. They're not going to tell you that <laughs> necessarily, but it, re it really does go in. Um, so make sure to have more heart to heart talks um, with your teens as well. Great. Next question. It comes from Florida. It says, my daughter was always hyperactive as a child. She was also pretty shy. Could this have been clear indications of her having ADHD? It's really tricky with that. Hyperactivity is difficult because I have seen children that have, are really hyperactive 
and they're actually anxious and not, they don't necessarily have ADHD. In those cases, especially um, what was described, I would definitely recommend the psychological evaluation if the hyperactivity is still the case to, to kind of tease out if it's anxiety that's causing that or if it's true ADHD because they look very similar, but until you get the test done to really see the difference, it's hard to, um, to make that distinction. Because I know I've had what we call the first session or the clinical interview with a parent and a child you know, will come with them and they'll tell me, oh, we'll spend an hour, hour and a half, they'll tell me all the things, very hyperactive and these sort of thing. And on paper, it absolutely looks like ADHD. And frankly, if you Googled it, it will look like ADHD. But once the, the true testing is done, um, they score, but really anxiety is increased and it makes kids look really hyperactive when they're very anxious. So I would definitely recommend a psychological evaluation for that one. Great. Thanks for the information, Dr. Hammond. The next question from, comes from Ohio, Columbus. It says, could you explain again, please, why blood work is necessary to do before diagnosing? What was, what was that last question? Um, it says, could you please explain again why blood uh, blood work, sorry, was uh, oh, necessary to do before diagnosis? Yes. Okay. So blood work is critical because what happens is a lot of kids that are hyperactive, attention issues, impulsivity, all the you know classic signs of ADHD, um, some kids actually have a medical condition. So even if you say, you know, they look healthy, right? Uh, my family's healthy. We don't have anything going on in the family. There's some kids that have thyroid issues, which look like ADHD. There's some kids I've actually, what I've seen a lot, um, kids have uh, anemia. So like low iron, which can look like ADHD uh, or uh, the other common one is like low blood sugar. But there, I mean, there's, there's a lot of physical things that can look like attention problems. So that's why it's really critical to get the blood work. Because what I like to see, or what you don't want to happen, is to go in for an evaluation, let's say for ADHD or mental health, but you don't know the medical part. Because then if you do that, then you can, I mean, someone could say, yep, it sounds like ADHD. Your child has ADHD. But really, when you go back and you look at the blood work, you're like, wait a second, this wasn't ADHD. It was because they had, you know, whatever, some physical health issue. And so what has happened, I actually... Anyways, a while back, I had a girl that she had anemia. So she, I mean, was tired. She had a little iron and things like that and, you know, kind of anxious. And then when she went back and she got the, um, like the iron tablets or whatever it was to help with the anemia, her symptoms cleared up, right? So you don't want to diagnose a mental health condition when there's really a physical health condition because you're going to treat it completely separately. So that's why it's so important to get the blood work first. And actually what I didn't mention earlier is you can take that blood work with you to the uh, psychologist's office, which would be helpful and say, Hey, I already got my blood work. Some parents do that. I love when they do that. Um, they say, you know, here, I've already got my blood work. Everything is fine medically. Okay. Now what's going on. So that way you can get a clearer picture. So that's, that's why I recommend the blood work first. Great, thank you for the clarification, Dr. Hammond. The next question says, what techniques would you recommend to treat a kid diagnosed with H, uh, sorry, with ADHD and dys uh, dyslexia? Ooh, dyslexia? Okay, um, so that's a good point. So depending on where you're located, uh, let's say you're in the United States, technically by federal law, if there is a learning disability, which is now called lear learning disorder, but more or less same thing, um, your child would be entitled to what's called an IEP, so an Individualized Education Plan. Uh, so that's IEP, Individualized Education Plan, which really, it could have a slightly different name depending on what state. Uh, but basically, that would entitle the child, especially with a, learn a reading issue, to, um, to have special modifications in the classroom, which is very, very important. I can't stress that enough. Um, they would have to change the curriculum because really all a learning disability means um, is that your child learns in a different way. So it doesn't mean they can't learn. It just means they learn in a different way. So that is going to be a really critical step when it comes to uh, learning disabilities. The thing at home to understand is 
depending on the child, some children really struggle with uh, self-esteem, with the issue of, especially let's say with dyslexia and uh, having difficulties with reading. So it is definitely your job as a parent to make sure that you stress what their strengths are for them. I've had many children, it's heartbreaking, um, but I've had many children that are like devastated when they find out that they have ADHD or they have dyslexia or another learning issue. But really I try to tell them like, I mean, I've done the evaluation, so I have the results and I will say, but look at that, like your IQ is so high, right? This is a great strength or you're great at sports or art or whatever else it is. So really, I mean, pointing out their strengths is really important because it's just a small piece of who they are, but really, I mean, all kids have their strengths. So again, so pointing out their strengths, really important to do at home, making sure in the school system that they have the uh, curriculum basically changed um, and have done the modifications to, especially with a child with a learning disability, um, to have that in place. And actually on the IEP, they can also put, in many cases, they can also put modifications in place for the ADHD as well. So it's ADHD and learning disabilities that they can do in one legal document. Um, and that's by federal law. Again, there's some exceptions and things like that, but more or less, that would be definitely my first step because the school piece is going to be critical. And then making sure they get the support at home. And if need be, definitely going to therapy. Thank you, Dr. Hammond. The next question says, when it comes to diagnosing a child, could bipolar disorder and ADHD be commonly mistaken with each other? Oh, yes, <laughs> definitely. Um, that's another one that, um, so that when I say another one, there's different diagnoses that really are commonly misdiagnosed and definitely, definitely bipolar and ADHD is another common misdiagnosis because the reason why there is such a misdiagnosis is because there's a lot of overlapping symptoms. So with bipolar disorder, sometimes in like the mania phase or uh, being very impulsive or uh, having a lot of excessive energy and things like that. I mean, those do overlap with ADHD. So that is why it's so important to tease those two things out with a psychological evaluation, because you can have both. Um, but oftentimes, as I mentioned, it's, it's, I mean, not oftentimes, but sometimes it's one or the other, but it's just a matter of looking at the different tests and how your child is performing. Um, to make sure that you have the accurate diagnosis. And I always stress accurate diagnosis because if you, I've seen it so many times, but if you are treating the wrong thing, it is very, very frustrating. It's frustrating to you as a parent, it's definitely frustrating to your child. Um, and it's just, I mean, it's, there's so much heartache that doesn't need to happen, if that makes sense. So getting a correct Diagnosis with a really in-depth analysis and comprehensive evaluation is critical to, to, to everything. I think I'm hearing a the theme um, with the questions, but it's it's really critical uh, to that first step to make sure that you're getting the right treatment and not treating the wrong thing. Thanks, Dr. Hammond. Another question around the same aisle. It says, uh, what does the psychological ADHD testing and titles? How does that work? Yeah. Um, so, well, one thing I will say is with an evaluation, when someone says, I want an evaluation to see if my child has ADHD, I definitely don't just test for ADHD, right? Because I wouldn't say, yep, they have it or no, they don't. So there's really, it should be a comprehensive test to look at. I'm looking at, is there ADHD? Is there depression? Is there anxiety? Is there oppositional defiant disorder? Is there, um, I mean, is there any psychotic behavior? Is there a behavior problem, right? The list goes on and on. There's like, 25, 30 things that I'm looking at. So what it entails generally, and it, it varies a little bit like specific tests, but more or less there's an IQ test in there just to get a glimpse of intellectually how your child is doing, which is very important. Um, the other piece is what we call an achievement test. So it looks at how is your child performing in the areas of reading, writing, and math, like what grade level they're on, let's say, or age that they're performing at which is important to look at learning issues, if there's learning issues. Um, the other piece is um, there's actually tests specifically for ADHD. So sometimes that is uh, what we call self-report. So a child may fill out a questionnaire, the teachers fill out a set of questionnaire, teachers, depending on how many teachers the child has, 
uh, parents fill out a set of questionnaires. And then there's a variety of tests. Um, there's some tests that are on the computer uh, that looks specifically at ADHD and they look at uh, like impulsivity and, um, and how they perform with attention. There's an auditory test um, that I gave that's done on the computer, but that specifically looks at uh, the auditory piece of attention. So there's a lot of different uh, tests that look at the different functions of attention. And then, like I mentioned, there's questionnaires, interviews, all sorts of other things to understand the other parts of a child's life, because that is very, very important in making the diagnosis of what is going on at home, how is a child doing socially, emotionally, personality-wise. There's a, there, I mean, there's a whole big picture. Um, but again, I, I am not a fan. I know that it's done, <laughs> um, but I am not a fan of having a one or two questionnaire that specifically only looks at ADHD and says yes or no. And I know that's a I mean, I guess that's a cost effective way to do it at many uh, family physicians offices. I'm not a fan because, again, that's like doing blood work for one thing and you don't look at anything else. <laughs> and it's like that's there could be so many other things going on. So so, again, when you think of a good evaluation, think of um, just a comprehensive look. You should be looking at about 20, at least 20 different things that could be going on with your child. Thanks, Dr. Hammond. We have a question from California now. It says, could ADHD be just a different way to cognize the world instead of a disorder? You know, I, I have heard that. I've heard that question a lot. Um, I, I want to say no, though. But but to your point, um, the you know, whomever is asking to your point, though, it has become so misdiagnosed that, yes, there are some kids or you know, even adults, obviously, that see the world in a different way, process it in a different way, um, but it, that's not ADHD. <laughs> um, ADHD is really, it, it can be really limiting on someone's functioning. So whether it's academic functioning, social functioning, emotional functioning, I mean, it, can, it really, it's hard um, sometimes when, it, when it's really ADHD. Um, another thing is that, well, again, as I mentioned, it's, it's very misdiagnosed, but another thing is that a lot of times the problem is in our society, we've gotten to the point where we said, we say, oh, they're so ADHD. Like it's just thrown out there. Like everybody's ADHD. Everybody's not ADHD. Okay. Everybody doesn't have ADHD. Every child does not have ADHD. Um, we're looking at around, depending on what study, 5%, maybe 10%, but everybody doesn't have ADHD. But the reason why, you know, to, to your question, it seems that way is because it's so commercialized, <laughs> um, which is why well, part of the reason I'm giving this lecture to understand that, yes, it could be ADHD, but there could be so many other things going on. Um, so I do, I do believe it exists. I know some people don't feel it exists and all that. I do believe it exists, but I know, we know that it's very uh, misdiagnosed. And yes, people that just look at the world in a different way um, and function in a different way are sometimes labeled with ADHD, which is not accurate and not correct. Thanks, doctor. Let's move on to a different question. It says, could we mistake ADHD with behaviors, with behavioral issues caused by problems in the household? Oh, yes. Very, very, very often um, that happens. So a lot of times when, and you know, it really happens, and I'm not here to blame the teachers. I love, I love my teachers, but sometimes uh, it happens with teachers because they will see, I mean, a lot of times we get referrals because the teachers will say, I think they have ADHD, they're out of their seat, they're misbehaving, uh, the child's not listening, they're not doing their work, you know, the list goes on and on. Um, but to your point, some children are having behavioral problems because they're uh, having a problem uh, coping with something that's happening at home. And that can be all sorts of things, but I have absolutely seen that. And what, so what happens, for example, is when I've done an evaluation, then uh, I basically find out, anyways, there's something called the sentence completion test, but it's where it starts a sentence, the child can answer however they want. And it's so interesting with that sort of test where kids will answer and be very honest and they will describe how they are struggling to deal with mommy and daddy's yelling, uh, mommy and daddy don't love me. I mean, th they're not even necessarily things that are true, uh, but there's, th but that's how they feel as a child. 
So because of those types of feelings, um, it develops into behavior problems sometimes. And kids, absolutely, they don't do their work. They're not, quote unquote, paying attention. Um, they're, you know, getting out of their seat or they're trying to seek attention, let's say, for all sorts of reasons. So, yes, I have seen that many times, unfortunately, uh, where children have been referred to think they have ADHD. They don't. Um, they're really just having a problem coping with something that's happening at home. So, yes, that is very, very true. We have reached now the last question of, of the show. It says, what do you suggest to take away the stigma of ADHD in society? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so a couple of things, and I know it's easier said than done, but one, this is something quite frankly that I've said many times. You have to do, as a parent, you have to do what is best for your child. So there's a stigma out there. Um, there are many parents, frankly, that have told me my fill in the blank, my mother, my brother, my sister, my whomever, they don't want me to be here. And that means in a psychologist's office, let's say, or they don't want my child to be labeled. They don't want my child to get help, all these sorts of things. What takes away that stigma though really is taking that first step to say, you know what? I'm going to do what's best for my child. Guess what? When you go to a psychologist's office, completely confidential with a few exceptions. So I'm not gonna be the one to call up anybody's family member, anybody's school, anybody's whomever. Um, but I'm most concerned with making sure that that family gets the help that they need. And that's what psychologists are concerned with. So it's just critical to take that first step, make that choice, which is hard. Um, if, you know, if in, in some circumstances, if a parent really needs to say, you know what, I'm not telling anyone that I'm coming to this appointment. My thought is this, I, I hope <laughs> one day we will get to the point where we can all share my child has ADHD, depression, and whatever it is. But at this time, if you want to keep that a secret and keep that information to yourself, by all means, do it. But get the help that your child needs. Because that's how we will get through the stigma is one person at a time getting help. The other thing you can do, which would be great, um, is sharing information. You would share information about a child having a physical health condition. When you see great things that are online, share that information with others when it's about mental health conditions, because I promise you there's somebody, you know, they may have told you or may not. There's someone, you know, some parent, you know, that really needs this information um, when it comes to mental health issues. So that's a step. The third thing is definitely, definitely, definitely education. And we are trying from, I'll say from well, my side in the field with psychologists and with other professionals, we're, we're trying our best to just, continue to spread the education. A lot of people, thank you for tuning in tonight because a lot of people really don't know this information and that's why there's so much stigma um, and there's so much fear around it because of a lack of information. So we're trying on our end to share the information. Definitely you share the information and definitely, definitely do not be afraid of getting your child the help they need. I can promise you one thing. Um, I've seen so many children, the earlier you start, intervening, the better. Most people wait wait years, but the earlier you start, the better um, to help your child. Thank you, Dr. Hammond. We have reached the end of these interesting talk. Thank you for sharing all the information with our Mindalia TV audience. Uh, we appreciate all the valuable uh, tapes and thoughts that you've uh, put into this lecture. Before we finish, we would like to give you a moment so you can say goodbye to our guest, to our, sorry, to our audience and give us your information so we know how to contact you. Wonderful. Uh, so again, thank you so much for everyone that has tuned in. Uh, if you'd like to connect with me, I'm on um, drnakeshahammond.com. It's D-R-N-E-K-E-S-H-I-A hammond.com and i'm on i think pretty much all social media but but all the social media links are on there um and yeah just reach out if you have any other questions i'd love to love to help you out thank you again dr hammond and to all the people who watched today thank you so much for your participation and for watching uh as life we'll see you next time on mindalia tv thank you all thank you